Hi, Bob DeMullen from ProDad and ProAdrenaline.com here today with Monica Zappa, musher for Team Zappa in the 2016 Iditarod. Monica, thanks so much for taking some time to talk to us. I know uh, with less than 24 hours to the start of the race, you got to be really excited. What's going through your mind right now? Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm very ready to be on the trail. Um, what's going through my mind is just you know, what are the trail conditions like? Um, are my dogs ready? Um, how are we gonna handle the competition? And um, you know, what's it gonna be like out there? What, what's the weather gonna be like? Really the weather makes all the difference on the trail. Um, but once we get out there, there's just a whole uh, pressure release, basically. So kind of all your nerves sort of start to fall away and you're just in the moment. So I just can't wait to get out there, yeah. So Monica, for people who are not familiar with the Iditarod or not from Alaska, when you're out on the trail, what are the conditions like out there? Well, that really just depends on, on weather, um, you know, what the weather is like at that moment, what, how much snow there's been there. Um, I think that's the really cool thing that I'm going to get to show everybody this year by, by carrying the Garmin camera and having a pro drill and do the editing and all that. It's going to be really fun to show everybody because I don't actually know what it's going to be like, but likely we won't have a lot of snow. It'll probably be a very hard trail, probably a lot of dirt, um, maybe a lot of slush, maybe water over top of ice. Um, I'm kind of expecting the worst just because of um, the warm winter that we've had and the lack of snow across the interior. So, you know, likely there'll be the, what we call overflow. So there's, there's maybe this much water on top of ice. Um, I just don't know what we're gonna expect. Hopefully it'll get cold and things will freeze up and we'll get snow and then it'll be a really nice trail. But uh, the reality is um, I'm prepared for probably not the best trail. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Exactly. That's that's kind of part of uh, running the Iditarod. That's what you have to do. So we've heard that uh, the lead dog, uh, King Dweezil, had a, an injury. How's he doing? Yes. Um, unfortunately, as such things happen, um, in our last week of training, he tore a muscle in his hind leg. Uh, I was completely devastated um, because that meant that he wouldn't be able to go on his first Iditarod this year, and he's been my main leader all season, so it's going to be very difficult to not have him. But uh, the good news is he's doing really well. He's recovering well. Um, his his limp is gone. He, he probably if it was up to him, would say he's ready to go. Um, but I know better and I just wanna uh, take the, the cautionary procedure and make sure that he is 100% healed um, because of course, if you push an injury, uh, it can become worse or even uh, permanent. So we certainly don't want that to happen. So by not having him go on the race, um, he's gonna be ready for next year. So it, it's a tough thing to deal with, but that's part of being a musher. Uh, Quite often, sometimes, your, your best dog is uh, not able to be with you. Well, that's a shame, but uh, have you selected a, a different lead dog? And one of the questions that we had from our audience on Facebook is, how do you pick a lead dog, and what are the qualifications, and how do you develop them? Yeah, um, really good question. The lead dog is the most important position in the team. Um, they're the ones who uh, set the pace and if they don't want to move down the trail, nobody else is going to move down the trail. So um, I do have another leader, um, Blue Steel would be, will be my main leader. Um, he has ran the last two Iditarods, so he's actually quite experienced. He ended up running last year in single lead for about the last 500 miles. So uh, that's a pretty incredible quality to have. So I feel pretty confident that we'll be okay. As far as picking a leader, um, it's instinctual. You can't really train uh, for a, a dog to become a leader. Uh, they're, they're either born with it or not. Um, since these are pack animals, a lot of them enjoy following. And so it is a, is a very special quality for a dog to be a leader. Uh, quite often it's genetic. Um, if their parents were leaders, um, there's a better chance that the offspring will be leaders, uh, which is the case with Blue Steel. And um, his brother, Manilix and Kevlar also lead, not with uh, quite the uh, consistency as Blue Steel, um, but they do lead. So, you know, I'll have a couple backups, and I think that they'll, you, you know, they'll do a really good job out there for us. So Monica, how many dogs are you going to be uh, going with this year? 
Well, uh, the maximum amount of dogs you can take is 16. So I'm going to take all 16. I'll have a full team. Uh, There's some mushers who will probably be going with, you know, a few less, maybe uh, 14 or 15 due to difficult trail conditions. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot of snow this year. So it can be difficult to manage 16 uh, very strong dogs. But I, I've done it before. I've taken 16 dogs um, my first year in 2014 on this trail, and it was probably worse than it will be this year so I'm confident that we, that uh, we can handle a full team and the reason I want to have a full team is because when we get further on down the race you know four or five hundred miles in um, there's a lot of hills and they have to haul a pretty heavy load so I just want to be able to have that power uh, throughout the whole race and so hopefully I'll be able to take you know 16 dogs all the way to Nome. Now of course there's a good chance a few will get dropped along the way uh, which is another reason I want to start off with a big team. Can you tell or can you explain to the audience a little bit more about the relationship between you as a musher and the dogs? Absolutely. Um, you know I think a lot of mushers would agree with me that that is the main reason that we do this kind of thing. Is run a thousand miles is um, for the experience that we get to have sharing that with our best friends which are our dogs. Um, it's an incredible bond and it's just tightened that much further by running across Alaska. You have to have so much trust in each other, especially between yourself, the musher, and, and your lead dog. Um, you know, you can also have almost have telepathy between each other by the time you get to know them. I mean, there, it's just that strong. Um, and, and, you know, you love them unconditionally, and they love you unconditionally, and it's an incredibly emotional and beautiful thing. So could you, or would you characterize the, the lead dog as pretty much the race is kind of in his hands? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you don't have a lead dog that wants to go, you're not going anywhere. So it is absolutely the utmost important position on the team um, to have to have a really good lead dog. And sometimes you, do, you think you have a lead dog and that dog decides he doesn't want to be a lead dog, but another one decides they do. So sometimes you, you uh, are surprised and you, you find dogs that just step up to the challenge and that's really exciting when that happens. Um, and, and you just never know uh, what's going to happen out there. But you share every experience with your dogs and you know these dogs look up to their musher uh, in an incredible amount and um, I think that that shows um, on every team and every yeah, I, I don't know it's it's hard to describe that relationship but it is an incredibly beautiful thing especially with your lead dog it sounds like a very special unique bond mm-hmm thousand miles from Anchorage to 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 Nome mm -hmm. at the Bering Sea. How many days does it typically take to, to run the race? I'm, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but uh, what's your expectation? Um, yeah, it is different for everybody. Um, last year I did it in 12 days. I'm hoping to shave at least one day off of that, um, maybe two. We'll see how things go. Um, if everything went just incredibly perfect, you know, maybe, maybe 10 days, but I'd be really happy with 11. I'm uh, just keep it improving um, from from my last year's run and uh, that will make me happy. Fantastic. So talk about just daily life on the trail. I mean, uh, do you go days without seeing people or are you do you see mushers every day and and human contact every day? Um, how the Iditarod is set up? Yeah, you see you see people every day. There's some races that are a bit more desolate. But um, there's 85 mushers going out on the trail this year. So, yeah, uh, you see, you, you usually end up running with kind of a pack after a few days. You'll kind of establish maybe four to six other mushers that you end up kind of uh, maybe not always seeing on the trail, but in the checkpoints and whatnot, um, you'll see a lot. And, and then, of course, when you are in the checkpoints, there's a lot of staff. There's volunteers, there's veterinarians, um, a, a number of veterinarians at every checkpoint checking all the dogs. So um, you interact with a lot of people um, throughout the race. Um, there's an incredible amount of personnel out on the trail to make sure this is uh, pulled off without a hitch. And it's a, it's a fun part of it too, making new friends out on the trail. Sure. Mushers and volunteers and year after year you get to know people better. and. Does Tim follow you along with the truck to take care of any animals that have to drop out? Well, no. Um, actually, there are no roads that go along this trail. Um, so everything has to be uh, delivered in and out by uh, airplanes. 
So Tim is actually, he may go to one checkpoint, I'm not sure, um, but he won't go along the whole trail. It'll be, I'll be out there, you know, uh, I'll be m by myself out there with the other mushers and, and whatnot. But um, if I do have to drop a dog, if, if somebody does get injured, um, the vets and the staff take very good care of those, those dogs and they fly them back to Anchorage and I've got staff here that will pick them up and take care of them until we get back. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Now, seeing that you will be traveling with 85 or 84 other mushers, is there a mental aspect to this, uh, to this race in terms of psyching out the competition and you know, obviously with the, the weather conditions are being so harsh, the terrain being so harsh, it's got to be a, a real uh, race for stamina and physical toughness and mental toughness, but I got to think there's got to be a mental aspect of this too. Totally. Um, I would say it's actually more mental than physical, and it is pretty physical. Um, yeah, when you're out there for oh, anything over five days, you've got, you haven't had more than two or three hours of sleep at a time um, it really takes a mental toll on you so the mental toughness is really important and it's also important because that uh, that mental attitude that you carry is rubbed off on your dog team um, your dogs pick up if you're positive or if you're negative so it's super important to stay positive um, at all costs if it's possible uh, but it the further you go the tougher it gets so yes. um, sometimes you know having positive other positive mushers out there does really, really help. Now, I probably, I mean, hopefully I'll be running in the top, in the in the top pack. I mean, that'd be really nice, but the reality is I'll probably be closer to the middle. Um, so it's a little less cutthroat. Um, it, it's maybe a little bit more friendly competition in the middle than, you know, your top 10 teams. They're kind of like out for blood and um, maybe someday I'll be there, but I don't know if it's going to be this year. So I get to have a little more fun with it than um, maybe some of those top competitors do. Got it. Okay, so when you cross that finish line in Nome, what's the first thing you're going to do? Scream for joy. <laughs> you know, um, probably hug my lead dog. Yeah, that's the first thing I do because, um, you know, your lead dog is, they're, they're the reason that you get there. Um, it, it is all um, their mental willpower, you could say, um, is, is what it takes to you know, go through the very difficult terrain and across the ice and um, you know, maybe through storms and no trail and um, you know, having a lead dog that's able to do all that deserves a big hug at the finish line. I'll bet, and a big steak too, I hope. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they get lots of treats when they get there. Blue Steel particularly loves belly rubs. So uh -huh. <laughs> he'll, be getting, he'll be getting lots and lots of belly rubs um, when he gets me to know him. Oh, fantastic. So at ProDad and ProDrenaline.com, we're gonna be following Monica's journey to Gnome. You can check out our Facebook page and uh, we'll also be tweeting out some updates. Uh, we have subscribed to the Iditarod's GPS tracker feature, so we'll have regular updates on exactly where she's at and how she's doing. We wish uh, Monica all the, uh, the best uh, for success and a good health, and uh, have a great race, Monica. Right on, Bob. Well, I'm so glad you were able to make it to Alaska and uh, join me for this incredible event and um, be able to see the dogs and just uh, be a part of the excitement. Thank you for coming. Fantastic. This is Bob Dumoulin from ProDad and ProDrenaline.com. Thanks for watching. <laughs>